The detection and subsequent shooting down of the Chinese balloon drifting over the United States caused diplomatic tension, meanwhile in the press and various social media platforms were posted lots of conflicting information about what happened and why. Let's clarify a few things and put the event in the historical context. Let's start at the end of the story. The Chinese balloon eventually was downed by an F-22 Raptor fighter jet with an M9X Cywander missile. Interestingly, in social media, many people commented that the action was unacceptable because it was wasting the taxpayers' money because of the expensive missile. In addition, many times it was brought up that because of the use of a missile, the Americans missed the opportunity to analyze the payload of the balloon. Many people claimed it would have been enough to shot down a few rounds into the balloon with the Vulcan rotary cannon of the Raptor. The balloon would have slowly descended and crashed over ground or water. The primary reason for using a missile was that the test simply could not be solved with the M61 Vulcan cannon because of several reasons. High altitude balloons can reach an altitude between 65,000 and 115,000 feet depending on the atmospheric conditions, their size and payload. The balloon flew in this case only at an altitude of 65,000 feet. This is not high for such a balloon, but for fighter jets generally it is considered extremely high. The peak sailing of the fighters nowadays is typically about 55,000 feet, no matter if they are single or twin engine planes. This ceiling means that they are still able to maintain the given altitude in horizontal flight, but at that point they have only minimal maneuverability. They flew on the edge of stall. The diagram shows the performance of an F-15 fighter without external stores and 50% fuel. Even with Mach 2 speed can sustain level flight only at 55,000 feet of altitude. It is not able to reach the highest publicly known altitude of the balloon. Not even considering cold winter temperatures. Even if the eagle could fly on the edge and somehow reach the 60-65,000 feet, performing the fine maneuvers to aim with the Vulcan cannon it would have been impossible. Regarding the Raptor, a performance envelope diagram with full afterburner engine power is not available. However, since the plane's aerodynamics have been optimized for maneuvering air combat in addition to its steel capability, it can be assumed that its maximum ceiling can be around 60,000 feet considering an average air combat configuration. However, fighter jets can climb above their nominal ceiling using their momentum, this maneuver is the zoom climb. This means a fighter plane at an altitude of 40,000 feet performs an acceleration to top speed up to Mach 2 or even higher speed. At this altitude the plane is well maneuverable, therefore it can do a steep climb. Thanks to this move, using a quasi-ballistic trajectory, the airplane can surpass the maximal ceiling. In extreme cases, the peak of such trajectory can exceed a height of 100,000 feet. Zoom climb was typically used for climbing and absolute altitude record-breaking flights. The problem with the zoom climb maneuver is that the plane flies at such altitude where the controllability of the plane becomes very poor below a certain speed. The control surfaces can be ineffective. In a sense, the only goal is keeping the free axis controllability the plane and avoid the departed flight. There is no way that a pilot would even be able to aim with cannon when a plane flying on a quasi-ballastic trajectory towards a calculated interception point. The relative speed compared to the target is a serious factor. The balloon is an almost static target compared to a fighter jet flying at twice the speed of sound, the relative speed is almost 600 meters per second. The effective range of the 20mm M61 Vulcan rotary cannon is around 1 km due its dispersion and ballistics. Because of the roughly 600 meters per second relative speed, there is short time to aim, fire and disengage to avoid collision. This is simply not safe. This case can be only imagined if the plane flies below the service ceiling. The final reason of avoiding the use of the Vulcan cannon was simply experience from the past. In 1998, two Canadian F-18 Hornets tried to shoot down a weather balloon and regardless of the 1000 fired 20mm rounds, the balloon still could fly away. That is why it was necessary to use air-to-air -air missile. The Cywander was more than capable of dealing with the some kilometers of altitude difference between the balloon and the service sailing of the fighter jet. 
Moreover, since missile aiming does not require such precise maneuver as the Vulcan gun, the launch can be carried out during a slight zoom climb maneuver if it is necessary. The AIM-9X Sivander is an infrared guided missile, its aiming can be coupled with the radar, so there is enough time to do that before launch. The payload under the balloon and the solar panels represents a huge radar reflecting surface. The radar of the Raptor easily could track the payload, the infrared seeker using the azimuth and elevation data could lock on the balloon. The AIM-9X missile has an imaging infrared sensor, it is essentially an infrared camera. It can see the balloon perfectly thanks to the sky background, even lock after launch is possible if the Block 2 version was carried. Thanks to the very large surface area of the balloon and the programmable seeker of the AIM-9X, it could be ensured that the missile aimed at the balloon and avoided the payload. It was enough time to prepare the missile for the special target. With the older AIM-9M version, the balloon would have been an impossible target. Its infrared sensor could only detect the hot gas plume of a jet engine, but the balloon would have been too cold. The Raptor flew at 58,000 feet when the missile was launched. The balloon was hit somewhere between 60 and 65,000 feet. The warhead of the sidewinder was removed, it flew through the balloon which collapsed following the hit. The Raptor shot down the target using minimal firepower as it could have used the longer range MRAM missile. Due to its active radar guidance, it is very likely that it wouldn't have hit the balloon but the payload underneath. The huge perpendicular surface of the solar panels and the additional metal parts represented a far larger reflective surface than the balloon. Even without a warhead, the end of the story would have been that, that the missile destroys a valuable payload which could be analyzed later. After the missile hit, the payload of the balloon began to fall at a relatively high speed, eventually crashed in the Atlantic Ocean, but within the 12 mile limit which is considered US territory. The balloon was dumped as a precaution only when it was certain that it crashed in the safe area or in the ocean. Thanks to the shallow water, which was only 50 feet, the wreck was quickly found. It was important to recover quickly, because the sea water is not friendly to sensitive electronics and equipment. The long-range high-altitude surface-to-air missiles in the US were dismantled in the early 70s. Therefore, it was not possible to shoot down the balloon with a SAM, since there is no such thing in the arsenal of the US National Guard. However, even if there had been a system, which is today completely obsolete, they were built around some large cities, so it was far from covering the entire country. Achieving such a soft kill, what the AIM-9X did was impossible, because they were rather guided SAMs. The Nike Hercules and the Bomark were designed with nuclear warheads, their conventional warhead had only training purpose. Currently, only Washington has a permanent deployed air defense with an SM system. Its maximal engagement altitude with the C-7 version of the MRAM missile is way below 65,000 feet. Even if the longer range MRAM ER version was available, the problem would be the same. Because of its radar guidance, it would have been hit the payload, not the balloon. What was the point of using a balloon in the age of satellites? The mission was likely not a photo reconnaissance, but an electronic reconnaissance because of the reflection properties of the ionosphere in certain frequency range. Furthermore, it would require a large number of satellites orbiting over its orbit to monitor continuously a relatively small area. The balloon is a simpler solution in many ways, it can stay near an area for a longer period. In addition, the balloon without an insignia is a bit of a grey zone when it comes to the airspace violations, while in the case of a manned airplane it is a quite clean its origin. During the Cold War, the top military leadership of the US desired accurate information about its opponent military alliance. However, obtaining accurate information was limited by the parameters of high altitude reconnaissance planes, which were special variant of subsonic bombers. The Mach 2 capable fighters could down them. Before the appearance of the top secret U 2 photo reconnaissance pipe plane, the Americans also tried to use balloons to spy on the military secrets of the Soviet Union. As a part of Project Genetrix, in 1956, between 10th of January and 6th of February, 516 high altitude balloons were launched from five different locations to take photographs about the Warsaw Pact and the Soviet Union. The balloons were launched from Norway, Scotland, two locations in West Germany and Turkey. 54 of these released balloons were recovered, but only 31 of them provided valuable data. 
An interesting side note is that the Soviets also benefited from the project. Many lost balloons crashed in the Soviet Union and were found relatively intact. With the help of the film material recovered from the lost American spy balloons, it was possible to take photographs of the far side of the moon. The US made film withstood the extreme conditions of space flight. The Soviet industry was incapable of producing the required film quality. The Lunar Free Space Probe utilized the film from this particular source. Thanks to that, Soviets were able to achieve both scientific and propaganda success. Because of extremely low efficiency, using reconnaissance balloons was discarded and the U-2 aircraft got the green light. It was already under development when the spy balloons were launched. However, Soviets expected further incoming spy balloons. The S-75 Volkov was able to shove down such targets up to 115,000 feet of altitude. The warhead of the missile was detonated by the guns station 120 meters from the balloon to achieve good coverage of the target with shrapnel. The U-2 missions over the Warsaw Pact and the Soviet Union were successful, they provided a huge amount of information. They often revealed the truth about the most secretly kept secrets of the Soviet Union. For example, it cleared the real situation about the bomber gap. The Soviet intercontinental bomber threat was greatly overestimated. Thanks to the U-2 missions, it became clear that the size of the Soviet intercontinental bomber fleet was roughly only 100 bombers, about 10 times smaller than the expected. The U-2 yielded countless other valuable pieces of information until the famous incident in the spring of 1960. That is a story for another time. If you like the video, you can share, like, subscribe or ring the bell and follow the channel. You can support it via Patreon for exchange for early access video, voting on planned topics and extra content is available and regular updates about the projects. So far 5 extras were released, their description is in the link under the video.